Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to talk this evening about whether there is any point to continuing to teach handwriting today. And since I'm a historian, the way I'm going to approach it is to look at the very strange story of handwriting, which is something that we take for granted, but which I've come to see is really a, a very, very complex topic. Uh, I blog for The Atlantic, and I noticed that one of the most controversial things that I wrote about was a piece defending the teaching of handwriting in the electronic age. It was a subject that people feel very passionately about, pro and con, and I'm going to try to do justice to both points of view today. But it's one that can be understood, I think, only in connection with the way it has evolved. Let me tell you about how I got into the topic. Uh, I was doing my PhD in Germany, and like other scholars of German history, I had to learn the handwriting of the German bureaucracy of the 19th century. The letters, and they don't look that bad actually, but when you get to the writing, it looks something like this. And it's, it's a sort of modulated uh, diagonal line, and you really have to learn the shapes of the letters. And it was designed for the bureaucracy to write as quickly as possible and to let everybody else figure out how to read it. And it was also taught this way in the schools. So uh, there was a culture of handwriting, and still exists in some parts of Europe, that uh, really places a great stress on the teaching of a uniform hand. And this is both its strength and its weakness. Handwriting can be a form of self-expression. It can be art. It can be religion. It still is for many people, but it also can be repression. Uh, there was one person who recently wrote about how he was caned in South Africa as a student for his messy handwriting and only later even now has, has rediscovered the fountain pen after, after overcoming this trauma. So I'd like to talk about the ages of handwriting and how handwriting began, because it was connected with a certain kind of social change. The first question is, well, just what is handwriting? And some people would say, well, it's, it's connected round writing or something like that. But actually, there are two kinds of handwriting. Handwriting can be cursive where one letter or form joins another, but it also can be distinct as in italic. And one of the problems of the handwriting movement is those people sometimes are, are angrier at each other than either group is with the people who want to abolish handwriting altogether. I've encountered that. Handwriting, though, is a mark of social progress. It's a mark of social advancement because now people have so much information that they need to write it fast. They need to connect the letters. So we find it in ancient society with the expansion of the ancient economy. Uh, this I call the age of reeds and feathers. Uh, and we can see this is a Greek, uh, ancient, ancient Greek writing. Uh, they really started a connected handwriting. Uh, this is ancient uh, Roman handwriting. By the way, in, in Roman comedy, we have the first mention of handwriting as resembling chicken scratches. That's in a, that's in a Roman uh, comedy. So uh, this, this, was, this was really a part of the, the tradition of writing in the, in the ancient world. On the other hand, when a Greek potter signed his work, he signed it in, in, in separated letters. So it, we didn't, they didn't have a, a notion of the signature as we have, but it was really a matter of, of practicality. You didn't, you didn't form the elegant letters, the monumental letters, because you were so pressed to put down what you had to put down. By the way, there are also uh, handwriting graffiti in, uh, in Pompeii. Uh, there is even a cursive form, uh, there are cursive forms of Asian languages, in this case a, a Chinese scroll. And uh, this is the form of rapid writing that grew up in the Renaissance. Uh, this first appeared in the papal chancery, and this was a form of writing that was supposed to be elegant. It was part of your occupational preparation. There was no real tension between a liberal education, a humanistic education, and a practical education, because the way you got a good job was to know the classics and to know how to write in an, in an elegant way. That's why the heads of 
United States departments are still called secretaries because the profession of secretary was really that important. When printing came, the traits of handwriting were not abandoned. Gutenberg did not change things that much. This is a, from a, uh, a text uh, of the, the early 16th century. It was the King's Greek, the, the Grec du Roi, these were hand punched, of course everything had to be hand punched, and there were 1,471 different combinations of letters and accents that the typesetters had to, had to set in type. So it, it was really a, a continuation of handwriting by other means. And uh, Arabic actually was a latecomer to printing because it is really such a calligraphic and cursive language. The Ottoman Empire did not allow the printing of books from movable type until 1735, so it, it waited hundreds of years. But it was still in that handwriting mode, and to some extent, uh, Arabic still is. The latest electronic fonts uh, can do an actually a, a much better job of Arabic than the old type could. Now, part of the age of reeds and feathers was the need to sharpen a quill. And this remained a limit to education until the early 19th century. Uh, if you can imagine, you have to pick up these feathers as they are being naturally discarded by geese and ducks, and you gather them up, and every time you use one, you have to, you have to sharpen it. And if you're a teacher, you have to teach your pupils how to sharpen their, their quill pens. That was an important part of being a schoolmaster then, and you can imagine what it would be like now if every single pupil had to learn how to sharpen a, a quill pen. So if you think that technology is difficult to implement now, <laughs> you don't know how lucky you are. And it was also an art, a very graceful art of the upper classes. This was a, a social uh, skill that, that men and women were supposed to learn. So if you see the letters of the time, many of them are written very, very elegantly. And this prepares us for a new age in the 19th century as education spread with mass literacy, uh, the age of graphite and steel. Uh, this was actually heralded by a document written with a quill pen, but it was written in a style that was especially designed for formal documents. And you can see John Hancock's signature there, so having this, this personal cursive mark was extremely important at the time. But there was also a new society coming about in which it was going to be very important that as many kids as possible learned how to write. And for this you needed new instruments, and one of them invented in France and made by the father of the author uh, Thoreau uh, was, the, was the pencil, which was an incredible story in its own right. But another one whose importance has been underestimated is the steel pen. The steel pen was really what made mass schooling possible. It's a step that has largely been forgotten. You can still buy them in some shops, but it was essential to the growth of national school systems. This is a beautiful uh, set that was produced about a uh, hundred years ago in Hungary. It was so important that in the late 1850s, a Yale student wrote a poem, Give me a pen of steel, away with the gray goose quill, I will grave the thoughts I feel with a fiery heat and will, and so forth. Uh, so it was a cultural icon, it was the emblem of a new age, and that student regarded the steel pen the way kids today might regard the iPhone. Uh, in this period, the profession of writing master grew up. This is one of the most famous, Platt Roger Spencer. And Spencerian handwriting was a very elegant and very sought after business skill. So instead of learning Microsoft Office for a long, long time, the goal of a student was to master 
the kind of handwriting that would make them a business success. Also, they were keeping records, they were keeping books with a, with a pen, and it was important to make the numbers clearly legible. Uh, even today, there is an influence of this. Uh, you can see that Spencer's signature is reflected in some of our leading trademarks, not only Coca-Cola, but Ford Motor Company. So it isn't obsolete by any means in the commercial sector. This is A.N. Palmer, and Palmer developed a version of the Spencerian writing, a simplified version that was taught very widely in the schools. In fact, when he published his manual about 100 years ago, it sold a million copies in its first year. But it was also the curse of handwriting because Palmer method was a highly mechanical method and the, the, the pupils really had to drill and drill and drill and that was absolutely no fun. So this guy probably is more responsible than anybody else for the mixed reputation that handwriting and handwriting uh, teaching has had ever since. Now, as he was doing that, actually, the world was moving into another phase, the keyboard age, with the invention of the typewriter in the late 1870s. And the typewriter at first was really not so much for speed, because if you, if you look at this design, somebody who was a fluent writer could do at least as well in words per minute. But what it really did was introduce into the growing bureaucracies of the time a uniformity of writing. If you had hundreds and hundreds of clerks in the US pension office, it was very advantageous not to have to learn to write uh, to learn to read the handwriting of every one of those employees. So the typewriter became faster and faster, but originally it was really for, for uniformity. It was to make writing look more like typing. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an office uh, that shows in, in, in Sears, Sears Roebuck how a lot of correspondence was still done by pen, but as these offices grew, they really had to turn to the typewriter. And it, there are images of not that long later where all of the pen and ink work has been replaced by typewriters. This leads us to the period we are now in, the screen age, and the rise of the smartphone and other screen devices, many of which can be worked without using a keyboard at all. Now, there are a couple of approaches to this revolution, and one of them is that of a distinguished uh, uh, historian of language, Dennis Barron, who wrote a book called The Better Pencil, and he writes in that book that in the 1930s, researchers found that children who were using portable typewriters, the, these are kids working the old-fashioned way, uh, children who were using portable typewriters performed up to 7% better on standardized tests. Well, if you look at statistical literacy, up to 7% is really not that impressive. It, it, it probably signifies something that's on the, on the borderline of significance. So he makes some good arguments in the book, but I don't think he's really that uh, persuasive. And after all, we don't really have to use handwriting. But then again, we have bicycles and cars. We don't have to learn to run. Uh, we, we have music players. We don't have to learn how to play the piano, we don't have to practice the scale. So be, just because something involves a lot of rote doesn't necessarily mean it's bad or obsolete. So let me make the case uh, for uh, the continued teaching of handwriting. By the way, in 1955, the first article appeared on handwriting being obsolete. I think they were really talking about a combination of, of typing and printing, but it did appear in uh, Look Magazine in September 1955. Um, when the modern computer age began with the Mac in 1984, there was a real irony. And it was that Steve Jobs was inspired to develop the Mac interface by a calligraphy course that he had taken, or rather audited, at Reed College. 
In fact, the font that he used on the first Mac was a variation of a script called Denelian. And if you remember the ads, you'll see the hello, just look at the H's, the E's, and, and the L's. And there was something very inviting, there was something very friendly about that, that personalized the Mac, something that really would not have been possible if they had used, let's say, Helvetica in that message. And that shows the subliminal power of handwriting, but it also coincided with another event that in 1984, the year of the launch of the Mac, Reed College abolished its calligraphy program and fired the teacher. <laughs> so where does this stand today? Well, the Wall Street Journal, which is not a neo-Leadite publication, uh, wrote in October uh, 2010 that using advanced tools such as magnetic resonance imaging, researchers are finding that writing by hand is more than just a way to communicate. The practice helps with learning letters and shapes, can improve idea composition and expression, and may aid fine motor skill development. Studies suggest there's real value in learning and maintaining this ancient skill, even as we increasingly communicate electronically via keyboards big and small. Frank Wilson, who is a neurologist, who has written a great book about the hand, expresses it this way. Although the repetitive skills that accompany handwriting lessons seem outdated, such physical instruction will help students to succeed these activities, uh, succeed. These activities stimulate brain activity, lead to increased language fluency, and aid in the development of important knowledge. Hand movements aid in developing deep feelings of confidence and interest in the world altogether, the essential prerequisites for the emergence of the capable and caring individual. And the illustration accompanying this is uh, Holbein's drawings of the hand of one of the great humanistic educators of the early 16th century, Erasmus of Rotterdam. So the question is, what is the place of handwriting in schools today? And I don't think it really has to compete with technology. It is technology, of course, but it doesn't have to compete with electronic technology. This classroom in Iceland shows that there can be a very happy coexistence between the new and the old medium. Uh, that together they can do more to keep students engaged. In fact, there are apps now for the iPhone that let you actually practice your handwriting using an iPhone screen. And I'd like to conclude with the objection that is, that is sometimes made to the fact that handwriting instruction may take the place of learning science and mathematics. Uh, the argument is often made by systems that want to abolish handwriting instruction that we, we need the time to prepare students for lives in science and technology. Well, there's an irony here because in contemporary science, although there are electronic laboratory notebooks, the most secure way of keeping records of your research for future publication or for patenting is still the lab notebook as we know it. So there is a coexistence then between the old and the new. And once we change our way of thinking, once we no longer think of either or, but once we think of how they can be combined, education can be improved even further. Thank you very much.